Good afternoon and welcome to season two, episode three of the Home Healthcare Today show. This is a very special episode edition. Granted that February is Black History Month. Uh, we have the distinct pleasure and honor to have Dr. M. Roy Wilson on our show today. Dr. Wilson became the 12th president of Wayne State University on August 1st, 2013. Since assuming leadership, President Wilson has pursued his vision to transform the university into the preeminent public urban research university known for academic and research excellence. In fall of 2020, Wayne State admitted its largest incoming class ever, a 4% increase over the prior year. The university's improvement in its six-year graduation rate earned the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities 2018 degree completion award, which recognizes innovative and successful approaches to improve degree completion and to ensure educational quality. Wayne State's graduation rate improvement was the best in the country in 2018. Gains were especially pronounced among first generation low income and minority students. As for diversity, as part of the plan to increase the diversity of Wayne State's campus, President Wilson created the position of Associate Provost for Diversity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer in 2014. He also created the Office of Multicultural Student Engagement to provide an inclusive environment and promote awareness initiatives that encourage academic success for underrepresented minorities and historically marginalized students. As for research and public health, President Wilson realigned the university's numerous research divisions to emphasize team science and cluster hiring of scientists. This effort was reflected in the 90 million bio multidisciplinary research facility which opened in 2015. He also launched the Wayne Med Direct Program, which guarantees exceptionally talented high school students from socioeconomically disadvantaged background admission to Wayne State's medical school to develop the next generation of physician leaders. As for development, Wayne State marked the successful conclusion of its Pivotal Moments campaign late in 2019, which raised $776.5 million, significantly surpassing its $750 million goal. This included several large record-setting gifts and much support from Wayne State employees, alumni, and friends. As for campus improvements, Beautification efforts have included the $26.5 million renovation of the Student Center building and the redesigned green space surrounding Fountain Court. In 2016, the university adopted a 10-year housing facilities master plan to meet the increased demand for living space. In 2017, Wayne State University entered into a novel public-private partnership to fund $310 million in new construction and renovation of existing facilities, adding 840 beds in new market rate apartment housing. Wayne State opened the Mike Illich School of Business located near downtown in 2018, made possible by a $40 million investment for Mike and Marion Illich. Groundbreaking took place for two major product projects in 2018, the $65 million Hillbury Gateway Performance Complex for theater, music, dance, 
and the arts and the renovation of an unused science library into the STEM Innovation Learning Center, which opened in fall of 2021. The university invested $4 million to upgrade and refresh Wi-Fi across campus to improve connection reliability and speed. All right, prior to Dr. Wilson's arrival at Wayne State, Dr. Wilson served as a deputy director for strategic scientific planning and program coordination at the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities of the National Institutes of Health. Previously, President Wilson was vice president for health science and dean of the School of Medicine at Creighton University. He was president of the Texas Tech University Health Science Center, chancellor of the University of Colorado Denver, and concurrently chair of the board of directors for the University of Colorado Hospital and Schutz Medical Campus. President Wilson also chaired the board of directors of the Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science and was acting president during that time. Dr. Wilson, <laughs> congratulations on all your major accomplishments over the last several years as the 12th president of Wayne State. And we humbly welcome you to the Home Healthcare Today Show. Well, thank you very much. That was very generous uh, comments on your part. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. And, you know, uh, most importantly to all of those professional uh, accoutrements and accomplishments, um, Dr. Wilson uh, is a husband of uh, a beautiful wife, Miss Jacqueline Wilson, children, Presley and Yoshio, and then I see a pup <laughs> a small dog listed here, <laughs> Quincy. <laughs> uh, Dr. Wilson's hometown is Yokohama, Japan. He received his undergraduate Bachelor of Science degree from Allegheny College, a Master of Science from UCLA, and attended medical school at Harvard Medical School. Academic research and focus, glaucoma and blindness in populations from the Caribbean to West Africa. <laughs> Wonderful, Dr. Wilson. Doc, with such an impressive background and so many accomplishments today, as we think about Black History Month and we think about public health and the like, tell us, Dr. Wilson, about yourself growing up. So way before the times of becoming Dr. M. Roy Wilson. Well, you know, let, let me first of all just say that um, <laughs> You know, during the pandemic, I, I had a little extra time because uh, my evenings were were uh, not as full as usual. And so I uh, wrote a book. It's on Amazon now. It's called The Plum Tree Blossoms Even in Winter. Yes. It's, uh, it's available for pre-order. It'll be um, uh, shipped out on May 4th, I believe. And it talks about my childhood, uh, which is a, a very interesting story because I was born in Yokohama, as you mentioned. I was raised by my mother, who's Japanese, for the first part of my life. And then, uh, you know, my dad, who was in the service, uh, came when I was probably around four or five years old. And then, uh, you, know, the, you know, obviously I uh, uh, was in on <coughs> uh, military bases and, and things like that. I. Um, I went to high school in the United States. I went to high school in Suitland, where I played basketball. I went to Allegheny College, mainly to play basketball, to be honest with you. Uh -huh. um, but it just so happened that Allegheny had a very good pre-med program. And so when I was there, I got interested in medical school and, um, and was lucky enough to get into Harvard, as, as, as you mentioned. Yes. Um, and then on from there, I did my uh, postgraduate training at Harlem Hospital Center through my internship because I wanted to be in a different environment from Boston because I knew I was coming back to Harvard to do my residency in ophthalmology. So I took a year to um, be in a different environment. And that's where I really got interested in health disparities and, and issues of uh, health in minority communities. Yes, sir, Dr. Wilson. Well, Doc, congratulations on the uh, publication of your memoir. Uh, we look to, Thank of you. course, you know, secure one of those pre-order pre -order copies of that book. Doc, it's Black History Month, and you, you talked about going to Allegheny um, to, to play ball, but then you uh, were accepted into the, the pre-med 
uh, program there. Uh, uh, talk to us about some of your heroes growing up, uh, whether they were national, international, you know, heroes, uh, and some of those challenges and, and hopes and opportunities that um, you pointed your mind to or that you focused on uh, during your uh, developmental years. Yeah, you know, let me just, um, this is not quite when I was growing up because I, I was already a, um, a medical student, but one of my heroes certainly is Nelson Mandela. Yes, and, and the reason why is I remember when I was um, a first year uh, medical student, uh, Dean Spellman, he's one of the deans at Harvard, came back from a trip from South Africa. And I remember we were talking and he was so depressed because he thought the situation there was just hopeless with apartheid and so forth. And uh, it, it just, I mean, he was just depressed. You can just see it on his face. Yes, sir. And then to see how that country turned around to do something which was seemed like a hopeless situation, but to overturn apartheid, and then for Nelson Mandela to become the president, yes, um, is just an um, uh, inspiring story. And and it's not just that he was able to do that, but the grace with which he did that, you know, yes. imprisoned and uh, still when he got out of prison. Uh, to think in terms of country first and not in terms of, Sir. you know, vindictiveness or other things that he could have been, you know, very angry person, um, but to be able to put the country first and do what had to be done to yes. do what he did, I thought really took a, a lot of uh, self-discipline. And um, I, I just think it's a, just a marvelous uh, story. Absolutely. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And uh, the unfortunately, Dr. Wilson, it seems as though that the the life and the times of the great late uh, Nelson Mandela, you know, aren't shared as much as as they should be. So I do appreciate you, you know, highlighting um, Nelson Mandela as a as a hero uh, during a pivotal time of your life. Uh, in terms of pursuing pursuing med school. Uh, Doc, as we fast forward and think a little bit um, about the work that you did um, as the strategic uh, scientific planning uh, in that program coordination as deputy director for the National Institute on Minority Health and then Health Disparities of the National Institutes of Health what were some of the big challenges, Doc, and some of your accomplishments um, in that role? Yes, yeah, so uh, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, has 27 institutes and centers. Yes, sir. And each of these institutes and centers has their specific focus areas. Yes. I have to be at the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, which obviously by its name, its focus area is on health disparities. Other institutes, for example, have focus areas in cancer or, or kidney or a cardiovascular system. Yes. And uh, my responsibility though, was the strategic plan for health disparities for the entire institute or National Institute of Health. So for all 27 centers and institutes. Wow. And each one of these 27 centers and institutes has a center director and has their staff, which, you know, they have their own um, <laughs> ideas about what should be done. And so sure. to bring all of them together and agree exactly. on a direction for health disparities for the entire NIH was a challenge, but, but Indeed. I think we'll get that done. Yes, sir. Very good. Uh, a lot of, lot of coordination, right? And then, uh, of course, a uh, Shared, shared missions and shared visions of uh, creating better health and wellness outcomes for the country, you know. Um, that, uh, as we think historically about those intersections between public health efforts and interventions and then public higher education, right? Uh, how have the two been intertwined in your uh, professional opinion to mobilize and to improve the lives of minorities and, and Black communities, per se? Yeah, so let me give you a concrete example 
that came out of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic crisis. Yes, sir. You know, yes, sir. early on, it was, became obvious that um, the the disease was was disproportionately impacting African American communities. You might yes, remember sir. that the death rates were much higher, and African Americans getting it at a much greater rate, and so forth. Yes. Um, I, you know, we recognize this as well, as well as others, but we took immediate action to try to do something about it. Mm -hmm. and, and I put up these mobile testing centers. Yes. One of the issues was that uh, African-Americans, these testing centers these, um, uh, that was available were not necessarily in, in black communities. True. They were in, in places where you needed a car to get to Yes. And testing was really important. Absolutely. So we recognized this and uh, our group from the university was able to get some mobile vans and uh, outfit them for testing and actually go to the communities yes. that were most impacted. And that really helped in terms of um, mm -hmm. getting African-Americans uh, tested uh, quickly. Yes. And as a result, this became one of the statewide strategies that were that was adopted. Yes, and I think that's a good example of how public health uh, interfaces with a, a university, uh, and we were able to do that because of the faculty that we have who are so committed yes, to trying to improve the the uh, health of the community. And then the the other uh, example I'll give is that you know in in the past. Um, a public health degree, a bachelor's degree was really unheard of, but That's starting true. around 10 years ago, mm -hmm. there started to be, uh, you know, some public universities that started offering public health degrees and a bachelor's degrees. Yes, uh, we were one of them. And so right. we now have a bachelor's degree in public health. And it, it's one of the, the most popular degrees now Mm -hmm. And and it's one where a lot of minorities like to go into because that's an, a way of trying to impact the health of communities is through the public health training that they get uh, in their um, undergraduate years. Absolutely, Doc. Well, that is a, a great, both are stellar examples. The uh, action, the action that the university was able to take to mobilize those uh testing sites uh, in urban communities in Detroit uh, is outstanding work. The Bachelor of Public Health program, yes, where uh, students are able to get their minds around the topics of sociology, uh, economics, in view of uh, health disparities, public policy. So some of the things that are oftentimes barbershop debates, right, or, or beauty salon, or even pulpit conversations to be able to really put the social science around the discipline and then to prepare students to be able to engage in work, uh, whether it's for profit or not for profit or civic is great stuff. Dr. Wilson, question number five, prior to us going to our uh, commercial break here. All right. It's about Detroit. <laughs> as well as Wayne State. It seems like 2013, right, was uh, yesterday, right? In reality, it was about nine years ago. <laughs> Out of all of the options and possibilities that you had to impart your wisdom, to lead, to engage, to inspire, and to extend your legacy, why Detroit? And especially back in 2013, when the city was going into its chapter nine bankruptcy filing. Right. Let's well, see. I'll tell you a story. And it's, <laughs> okay. and it's a true story. Okay. Now, you know, as, as you read my bio, you know that I've been at a lot of different universities and held yes, different sir. positions at a lot of universities. Absolutely. This is, my, this is actually my fourth presidency. Yes, sir. And, and I was working at the NIH at the time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really, I mean, it, it was great in so many different ways, but, you know, working for the government can be challenging. Yes, sir. And, and I was missing being at a university. And I remember being at dinner with a friend of mine <laughs> and, and telling her that, you know, I miss being university president and I might go back to being a university president. But yes, this sir. time, since I've, I've kind of been at big ones, small ones. <laughs> yes. You know, 
rural ones, urban ones. I knew exactly what I wanted. Uh -huh. And I said that if I go back to being a university president, yes, the university would have to be public rather than mm -hmm. private. I mean, yes, sir. It would have to uh, have a big medical center because I'm a physician and I think that's how you had it. Yes, it would have to have high research because I'm a researcher. Yes, sir. It would have to be urban. I've been mm. both urban and rural, and I, I enjoy urban. I think, and the final criteria is that it would have to be intimately connected to its community. Mm. Those are the criteria. Yes, sir. And so she asked me. She said, "Well, what university <laughs> fulfills that criteria? All that yes, all those criteria." And I thought about it because I wasn't thinking of a specific one when I mentioned this. I was just thinking about, you know, what the criteria would have to be. Yes, sir. And then I thought about it for about 30 seconds. And then I said, well, you know, Wayne State satisfies all that. <laughs> and then yes. about six months later, Wayne State called and said they were <laughs> beginning a search for president. I wondered yes, if I might be interested. So yes. I thought it was, uh, you know, some sort of divine intervention or something. Yes, it was. was <laughs> and saying that's the kind of university that I'm going to go to if I if I decide to leave the NIH. And yes, then, sir. You know, that's the university that I get a call from. And so the rest, I came and visited, and the rest is history. But it's a true story. Yes, sir. I believe it. I believe it. Uh, uh, it's beyond serendipity, you know, certainly divine where you're. I, uh, I tell you another part of the story. Yes, sir. So I was the only candidate who mm. insisted um, on, you know, as, as happens in most searches, you, you yes, stay at the airport and you get these airport interviews. Yes, sir. And uh, I insisted on, on being able to spend time on campus. Yes. Uh, during my second interview. Um, you know, not publicly, but but I wanted to kind of see the campus. I wanted to see Detroit. Yes. I, I walked from the campus down to a restaurant uh, <laughs> at this globe at the time. was uh, it, no, It's no longer here. Uh -huh. But walked down there to uh, have dinner, walked down to a coffee shop down that direction. You know, just to kind of get a feel for it. Breathe it, and, smell and, it. And, yes, and, sir. Yeah, yeah, right. And instead, <laughs> of, and instead of being turned off, I was actually turned on by good by, and I and, and I was able to say, you know, I kind of saw it and I said, you know, there's just so much opportunity here for yes. uh, to make something uh, beautiful. And and I think that's really what has happened to Detroit over yeah. the past uh, nine years, right? Yes, it has. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so I was actually turned on by it. Absolutely. I'm so glad to hear this, Doc. And for me, this is uh, really enriching. And I know that our viewers and our uh, listeners on the podcast are going to be able to really appreciate the sentiments of, of that uh, experience. Uh, I do remember reading about your arrival in the um, Cranes, Cranes Detroit business in, in 2013. Uh, I myself, a native of Detroit, um, was thrilled to to read about your background and your your coming to Detroit and was very hopeful uh, about your contributions and uh, I was returning back myself. I grew up in Detroit but spent uh, about fourteen years in Chicago uh, as a faculty member and an engineer and the desire and need to come back to the D you know just continued to pull pull at my heartstring and. And so glad, Dr. Wilson, that I came back, but especially glad that uh, that you came here and, uh, and graced us with your brilliance, graced us with your diligence, and are having such an outstanding impact on Wayne State. And uh, well, Metro thanks for Detroit. coming back also, and uh, thanks for everything you're doing for us. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Doc, we're going to take a uh, brief break here to go to a commercial. And then we'll come back and spend another 15 minutes or so diving into another five Thank questions. You. Thank you, Doctor. Right.
right, so welcome back to season two, episode three of the Home Health Care Today show. This is a very, very special episode, right? Um, we are uh, have the distinct pleasure to be joined by Dr. M. Roy Wilson, the 12th president of Wayne State University. Dr. Wilson, let's uh, pick up where we left off with a few more questions. Let's focus on Wayne, Wayne State University. The strongest enrollments in the university history under your leadership. What were some of the pivotal moments, doctor, over the last eight to nine years and, and how and what were the driving forces while so many other urban institutions seemingly were going in an opposite direction, Wayne State has continued to, to grow and expand. Please elaborate. Yeah, so in 2020, uh, which was right in the uh, start of the pandemic, we nonetheless had a, a very, very uh, strong freshman class. In fact, it was the largest in the history of the university, about a 4.2% increase over 2019. And 2019 was also a very large freshman class. It was either second or third largest in the history. Of yes, sir. Years. So it was built in on, on a, a large class and, and we felt very, very uh, good about that. I think that um, you know there there are a number of things. You know, one is that we really put a focus on the students. Uh, uh, we really tried to meet them where they where we got rid of some some policies that just didn't make any sense. Yes, sir. Uh, that discouraged students from coming. Um, we we streamlined our, our financial aids. We offered um, uh, different aid packages that we didn't have before. Uh, the the Detroit. Um, the Heart of Detroit program, for example, where all Detroiters, whether you live in Detroit or you just go to uh, school in, in Detroit, can come to Wayne State without paying any tuition, you know, wow. basically free. Um, you know, we rolled that out and, and that we had a, a large number of Detroit kids come as, right. as a result of that. And that's just one of the programs that we had. And so it's a combination of, of focusing on the students, Yes. Uh, uh, doing some financial aid uh, uh, programs that we didn't have before, very generous ones, uh, focused toward low income and minority kids. And then the 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 um, uh, the last thing I probably have to put in there also uh -huh. is, you know, we're partners with Detroit and when Detroit does well, we do well. Yes, sir. When Detroit doesn't do well. You know, sometimes that affects us also, but we, yes, we're we here, you know, we, we've been here for 152 or 150 years. <laughs> yes, sir. And, um, you know, through thick and thin. And, uh, you know, Detroit has has um, bottomed out and yeah. and it's doing much better, right? Absolutely. Uh, yes, it is. You know, yes, Midtown is. particularly is, is a, a thriving environment and yes. uh, there's you know, students, when they come to visit, they, they see that. Sir. They see there's a lot going on in the city. Yes, and, yeah. and they want to be a part of you know that excitement, not only from an entertainment standpoint, but from an educational perspective to yes, be sir. able to, you know, have an impact on some of the communities that uh, that's really positive. That's not just a, a book learning, but you right. uh, have a, a positive impact in doing things that yes. uh, that um, uh, is good for the uh, community. Absolutely. And so they, they see all that, and and I must uh -huh. say that you know <laughs> other universities see that too, and yeah, uh, many universities <laughs> that, that haven't been here for 153 years are all of a sudden seeing Detroit as being someplace they want to be. I'll Absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, for some of those other ones, uh, Dr. Wilson, they could do their quote unquote service learning, you know, activities and efforts to engage, you know, students with, with community. Um, but they could really learn service <laughs> by watching, watching the work at Wayne State and uh, all the campus upgrades and the beautification uh, there in Midtown and the economic development allows a lot of urban students from the local neighborhoods to feel as though they have an experience of going away, but still staying and being at home, you know, close to family and community. Uh, Doc, you mentioned the mobile uh, COVID testing sites. Are right. there any other ways that, yes, yeah, sir, um, as we think about public health and 
health yeah. navigation and social determinants of health. Are there any other ways that Detroiters uh, can find themselves to be, you know, uh, beneficiaries of, yeah, sure. you know, Wayne? Sure. You know, um, you mentioned in the introduction the yes, sir. Um, $90 million iBio building. Yes, sir. It's a state of the art research facility. Uh, but what we did is we decided that we were not going to do all types of research there. We were going to focus our efforts on the types of diseases that most affect and impacts Detroiters. Yes, sir. So we're talking about things like cardiovascular disease, obesity, um, things that really Detroit is having problems with. Yes. Real health disparity issues for Detroiters. Yes, sir. And we, we started recruiting faculty to study and to take care of patients in these areas to try to investigate ways to try to um, impact, positively impact the, the treatment uh, uh, of these uh, diseases. Yes, and, and we do it by, by um, recruiting faculty that have different skill sets. You know, for example, in obesity, it's not just one type of of researcher that's going to no. get obese. You know, you're talking about obesity has psychological um, uh, uh, components to it, it has obviously yes. has physiological components, Economic. biochemical. Yeah. Yes, sir. You know, it's really very, very uh, sociological. It, yes. It's, it's very broad. And in order to really uh, uh, impact it, you know, you need people who approach it from different vantage points. Yes, sir. And, and work together. And so that's what we've been doing. And I think Detroiters are the direct beneficiaries of that. Wonderful, Doc. Wonderful. Doc, our work at American Advantage Home Care, you know, we go out into communities and we provide that skilled nursing and uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and a, a host of other services to the homebound patients in Detroit. And the pandemic exacerbated you know, as you mentioned earlier, those disparities uh, and really gave us a, a clearer picture of the 40,000 or so homebound residents in Detroit. That, with that being said, I know we mentioned earlier the Bachelors in Public Health program. Do you see any other opportunities for perhaps education and training uh, for students um, in the, perhaps the School of Nursing, College of Health Sciences, and some of the other programs to focus on some of those homebound uh, patients and their, their unique needs and circumstances. You know, we're all doing things differently as a yes, result of the pandemic, and we're yes. learning a lot as a result of the pandemic. And there are some things that, that we pivoted on and, and we're doing things differently that we'll never go back to doing exactly as we were doing before. True. And, and True one that. of the things that I think this pandemic has, has, uh, has highlighted is the importance of telemedicine. Yes, sir. And the, and the importance of going to where the patients are rather than expecting patients to come to the mothership. To the yes, sir. Hospital. Um, look, and, you know, when you think about it, there are just so many things that can be done at home. Yes. That you don't really need the patients to come to the hospital for. True. Uh, and, and, and a lot of it can be done, you know, by telemedicine through yes, virtual sir. means. And yes, we're, we're learning yes. that. And, yes. And uh, we're, we're perfecting that. And so I think that whether it's um, nursing or or uh, medicine or um, uh, one of the other uh, health related programs mm -hmm. that, we, that we can all, uh, we are all learning how to take better care of patients where they are yes, rather sir. than having them necessarily come to the hospital. I mean, Absolutely. you know, obviously if you need a, uh, an x-ray to, you know, because you have a broken bone or something like that, there yes. are certain things that you have to come to a hospital for. Yes, but sir. There are a lot of things, but you know, it's yes, a lot of number. I'm going to say probably 90 <laughs> percent. That, that could be taken care of uh, in a in a different way, where where you go to the patients. And yes, sir. It's, uh, physically or or uh, virtually. 
Absolutely, Doc. That's encouraging and inspiring. We're going to, you know, find ways to, of course, collaborate uh, with the various colleges and schools there at Wayne uh, as we develop a health navigator app where we're looking to be able to provide patients and families with virtual resources in the palm of their hands to be able to connect to resources, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Doc, we have two, two last questions here to, to wrap up um, this episode. Any other resources, uh, Dr. Wilson, clinics and specialists or groups around Southeast Michigan in terms of that health navigator or health navigation uh, that you would recommend to help improve overall health and quality of life um, for uh, patients and, and residents in Metro Detroit? Well, for overall health and quality of life, I would yes, say, sir. first of all, that um, I would urge all of your listeners to go out and get be active, exercise, physical activity. Yes, sir. I think that's wonders, right? Stop yep. being sedentary. Yes, sir. You know, if you go to the gym, if you can, if you can go to the gym, you know, walk, uh, do, do something physical. <laughs> uh, I yes, think sir. that really does wonders. But outside of that, in terms of uh, facilities that can be helpful. You know, we, we certainly have one on uh, MAC, I think it's a 400 MAC, which is a multi-specialty uh, service where we have uh, all kinds of different uh, doctors and, um, and nurses and other uh, healthcare providers, um, sure. in, including children um, that uh, people can come to it's very, it's ambulatory. It's it's very easy to get to, and uh, and hopefully it's, it's it's very convenient and inviting. But th there are a bunch of places like that. I, I think the important thing is to um, uh, try to be as preventive as possible. Uh, go in and be active, as I said. Exercise. Uh, get your um, your annual checkups. You know, don't let COVID stop you from getting the re regular medical care that you need. You know, certainly, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, during surges like like we're in right now, you have to be sure. careful about that. But but you know, um, uh, make sure that you continue to take care of the you know, your non COVID needs. And yes, there sir. are a lot of facilities where you can go to that's uh, open and that will um, you know take care of you. So absolutely, make sure you continue to do the the things that you're supposed to do to take care of yourself and and not just hunker down at home and uh, um, be afraid to, you know, uh, go out and, and be checked. Absolutely. Great advice, Doc. Great advice. Doc, last question for you. Um, considering Dr. Emroy Wilson, mentoring, impact, and influence is at least a two-way street. You are certainly one of my personal, professional, uh, and academic heroes. Um, you have positively impacted, inspired, and influenced me and thousands of others. Um, as you think of your place in history, because you do have a, a Wikipedia page, doctor, <laughs> what do you see as your greatest impact, accomplishments, and greatest hopes? Yeah. You know, I was, I was asked that one time by my college for, um, you know, for their magazine, and this was many years ago. And at the time, this, like I said, this was, um, you know, many years ago. At the time, I, I still ha I hadn't been, uh, you know, president of a university yet. I had been dean of, a, of a, um, a medical school and president of a health science center. Um, what I said at the time was when I was chair of the Department of Ophthalmology at the King Jew Medical Center, I took a lot of uh, chances on accepting residents that would not have been accepted at other residency programs because other residency programs looked at test scores and things like that. And I looked at other things. I looked at, you know, not how well you can score on a test, but what they were like as people yes, and would they become good doctors and took chances on, on many. And the, so gratified when years later, you know, all of these uh, residents, most of them are minorities, uh, who, as I said, weren't necessarily good scores on tests and things like that, but I saw something special in them, accepted them into the residency program, 
and then see them become such fabulous uh, ophthalmologists was it just uh, uh, just you know something that that has uh, always impacted me and gives me purpose in life. Um, now I, I would say the same thing, except I would expand it more mm -hmm. and say it's not just ophthalmology residents to be, be able to provide opportunities for low income and minority uh, students to become ophthalmologists, but to expand it more to become, you know, biomedical researchers and practitioners and just, you know, um, um, help in some way in the in the pipeline of students. That's what I want to do in terms of the latter, the last part of my career. Yes, uh, you know, when I finish doing what I'm doing now is really focus on the pipeline to biomedical research and biomedical training and uh, try to help as many uh, kids as I can get into Wonderful. those fields. Yes, sir. Well, you are doing it, Dr. M. Roy Wilson. We thank you. We thank you for being a historian. Thank you for being who you are and for what you have done and what you will continue to do in the lives of others. Dr. Amaroy Wilson, it's been a wonderful pleasure having you on our show for this uh, Black History Month episode of the Home Health Care Today show. Well, thank you for the invitation. I enjoyed being with you. Thank yes, you. Sir, you're welcome, Dr. Wilson. Take good care now, sir. All right, bye-bye now. Bye-bye. <laughs>